Esther and Elizabeth like it. She had four siblings, an older set of twins, Diana and Daniel, and a younger set of twins, Jenny and Benny. Sylvia was a sweet sixteen. She 
Jenny up the stairs and whipped her with a leather belt. She said, quote, well I took care of you two bitches for a week for nothing, end quote. The money arrived in the mail the day after the first spanking. Sylvia and Jenny's parents came a few days later and gave another advance payment. The sisters said nothing of the beating. When Gertrude learned that Sylvia was recycling pop bottles for cash, she cut loose on her with a quarter inch wooden paddle. She hit her repeatedly across the back and head. When Gertrude became weak due to chronic bronchitis, she handed the paddle to Paula. The beatings increased in frequency and severity. Gertrude may have felt sorry for Jenny due to her fragility, because by 1965, Gertrude concentrated her outbursts on only Sylvia. Sylvia admitted she had a boyfriend in California. Gertrude was disgusted, and so was her daughter Paula, who repeatedly kicked Sylvia in her vaginal area and accused her of being pregnant. Not only was she subjected to beatings, but Gertrude also started abusing Sylvia with food. Sylvia began to forage for food in dumpsters. When Gertrude caught Sylvia, she, Paula, and a neighbour's child called, named Randy Leper forced her to eat a hot dog loaded with copious amounts of condiments and spices. When Sylvia threw up, the trio then made her eat the vomit. The girls returned to school in the fall, which pleased their father. Gertrude accused Sylvia of spreading rumours that Paula and Stephanie were prostitutes. Gertrude admonished the girls in front of her own children and their friends. Stephanie's 15-year-old boyfriend, Coy Hubbard, attacked Sylvia in response. Stephanie snickered as Gertrude taunted Sylvia by calling her filthy names. Gertrude accused Sylvia of stealing gym clothes. As punishment, she burnt her fingertips with a lit match while screaming that she hated Sylvia and how she was ruining her life. Somehow, the subject turned to Sylvia's alleged promiscuity. She should never be doing anything with a boy until you are married, Gertrude cautioned. Sylvia replied she hadn't, which only infuriated Gertrude. You should never, Gertrude shrieked as she kicked Sylvia's pubic area repeatedly. Kicking Sylvia did not please Gertrude. She made Sylvia strip naked and inserted a glass cola bottle into her vagina while her child accomplices watched and laughed. Sylvia's parents checked on their daughters on October the 5th. Again, they kept their secret, afraid of making it worse. As abusers do, Gertrude banned them from seeing their sister Diana, who lived nearby. Gertrude alienated them from anyone who cared. Paula once held the door open and dared Sylvia to get away and stay away. But Sylvia had nowhere to go. Sylvia's last day of school was October the 6th, the day after her parents' visit. Gertrude told the school Sylvia had no interest in going and pretended to be concerned. But in reality, Gertrude banned Sylvia to the cold basement. Quiet. Sylvia's primary attackers. He enjoyed body slamming Sylvia forcefully onto the concrete basement and tying her up for days at Gertrude's urging. Kids from the school visited the residence and participated in Sylvia's torture. Gertrude, the ringleader, coached them step by step. Nothing was off limits. If the children wanted to practice judo, Gertrude had them practice on Sylvia. Some kids put cigarettes out on Sylvia's skin to hear her cry. Gertrude would bathe Sylvia in scalding hot water until her skin blistered. Paula 
face until she broke her wrist. Doctors put a cast on her arm while Paula bragged about exactly how she broke it. When she got home, she continued to hit Sylvia with her cast. Gertrude used a needle to carve the letter I into the flesh of Sylvia's abdomen. Unable to finish the false statement, she encouraged her 15-year-old neighbour, Richard Hobbs, to complete the task. I am a prostitute. I'm proud of it, he etched on her belly. Gertrude helped him spell prostitute. At Gertrude's request, Richard heated a metal hook and attempted to brand the letter S on Sylvia's chest, but instead branded her with the number three. Gertrude justified it by saying Sylvia branded her child and now she had branded Sylvia. What are you going to do now? You can't get married now, Gertrude would taunt. Sylvia whimpered, I guess there's nothing I can do. Coy returned and tied Sylvia up in the basement where he slammed her frail body into the wall over and over again. Gertrude finally broke Sylvia's spirit. Jenny, she consoled her baby sister. I know you don't want me to die, but I'm going to die, I can tell. Her voice was weak and trembling. The beatings made Sylvia incontinent. Sylvia started to lose control of her limbs too. Gertrude knew Sylvia was taking a turn for the worse, so she permitted Sylvia to sleep on the mattress in the upstairs bedroom. After giving her a lukewarm bath, she condemned her back to the basement and forced her to write a letter. The letter said, To Mr and Mrs Likens, I went with a gang of boys in the middle of the night and they said they would pay me if I would give them something. So I got in the car, and they all got what they wanted, and when they got finished, they beat me up, and left sores on my face and all over my body. And they also put on my stomach, I am a prostitute, and proud of it. I have done just about everything I could do to make Gertrude mad. And cause Gertrude needs more money than she's got. I tore up a new mattress and peed on it. I have also cost Gertrude doctor's bills that she really can't pay. And I've made Gertrude a nervous wreck and all her kids. That night, Sylvia heard Gertrude and her children making plans to dump her in the woods. In a last ditch effort, Sylvia tried to run. But Gertrude caught Sylvia, dragged her inside, and attempted to feed her toast. Sylvia didn't have the strength to eat. Gertrude then stuck her, struck her face with a curtain rod. Her son John returned her to the basement. John tied Sylvia's wrist to the basement railing. Her toes barely touched the ground. Gertrude shoved crackers into Sylvia's parched mouth. Sylvia told her that she wasn't hungry, and she suggested she fed them to the dog. Gertrude then punched Sylvia in her belly. John force fed her the contents of baby Jenny's diaper, as well as her own feces. October the 25th, Gertrude, Cody and John beat Sylvia until she lost consciousness when Gertrude stomped on her head. When she came to, she gathered up enough strength to bang on the basement floor and walls, hoping someone would help her, but no one came. On the morning of October the 26th, 1965, Gertrude and Stephanie bathed Sylvia. During her bath, Sylvia stopped breathing. The Banowskis were terrified. Not because they cared, because they would be caught. Stephanie tried unsuccessfully to revive her. 
noticed that Sylvia's lips were practically chewed through. All ten of her fingernails were bent backward and broken. She had hundreds of wounds on her skin, all of them in different stages of healing, suggesting ongoing trauma. Dr. Charles Ellis performed the autopsy. The cause of death was torture. The police asked Jenny what happened, and she parroted that Gertrude said, but added, quote, You get me out of here, and I will tell you everything. End quote. Gertrude was convicted of first degree murder. Paula, convicted of second degree murder. They each re- received a life sentence, but after a second trial, Paula pled down to manslaughter and was released two years later. Gertrude was paroled in 1985. She claimed she had no money of her, no memory of her actions. She died four years later of lung cancer. If there is a devil in hell, he is currently roasting the old bat over hot coals. Paula moved to Iowa where she secured a new identity and a job at an elementary school. Stephanie married, had several children and became a school teacher. Richard Hobbs, boy husband Hubbard and Gertrude's son John were convicted of manslaughter. All received two 21 year prison terms of which they served two years. Richard died of cancer at age 21. Baby Denny was adopted into a new family, as was the daughter Paula was pregnant with during the crime. Jenny Likens married and had children of her own. She lived long enough to read Gertrude's obituary, which she mailed to her mother with a letter that read, Sub good news, damn old Gertrude died, ha ha ha, I'm happy about that. The death of Sylvia Likens continues to haunt Indianapolis as the worst crime ever committed in the state. The house sat empty for decades before it was levelled. It is now a church parking lot, but there's a memorial dedicated to Sylvia's memory and it stands in Willard Park where Sylvia used to play. Thank you for listening today. If you like videos like this, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and please check back daily for another new crime case. Until tomorrow, bye bye lovelies.